in the busyness of life and with the increase of the use of electronic tools, a wide variety of electronic tools that we have in order to uh, connect with people. And they are important. They're, they're part of our lives. They're, they're part of our culture. But, you know, somewhere along the way, I think we have lost our sense of the value of personal contact with people. To see them face to face. To even hear their voice. This is interaction that is at the heart of real communication. It is communication that is essential for developing deep and personal relationships with people. Think of it. Isn't that what we need in our marriage? Isn't that what we need in our family? You can't send a text to everyone all the time. There has to be personal contact. And, and whether it's our friends or, or even our, our business associates or our brothers and sisters in Christ, it is important that we have that personal contact. In fact, it is fundamental. It's a fundamental part of who we are and developing those relationships in our lives. And as we come to the end of our time in the book of Titus, In looking back over these three short but powerful chapters, we see that the Apostle Paul has been instructing us on the importance of relationships. On relationships we have, on relationships that we are developing. And he reminds us, first of all, that our relationship with Christ is at the core of all uh, of our other relationships. That without a relationship with him, we can't develop the right kind of relationships with other people. A relationship with Jesus Christ is the starting point of all other relationships. In fact, it's the starting point of everything in our lives. A relationship with Jesus isn't an option. It is essential. It's essential not only for this life, it's essential for eternity. And then in Titus, Paul discusses our relationship with those in the church, with the leaders in the church. What kind of men should be leading God's people? What kind of men should be helping us to understand the truth of the word. What kind of direction should they be setting for us? What kind of example should they be? What kind of character should they have? Then Paul talks about our relationship with each other. What should our relationship be like as brothers and sisters in Christ, as those who belong to him, as those who are part of the family of God? How should we treat each other? What should our relationship be like as those who are part of the same household? We will spend eternity together. And Paul discusses our relationship with those outside of the family of God. Those that we encounter at work or at school. Sometimes at home. Even with those in the government. Those who have authority over us. In all of these relationships in everything we do and with everyone that we have contact with Paul says this we need to remember that it is by the grace of God that we are who we are that it is by his grace that we have been saved so we owe everything to him everything so our reaction should be To honor him. Shouldn't we long to serve him? Shouldn't we long to give him our entire lives? You know, even as we seek to do that, even as we seek to live for Jesus and to honor him, 
Even with the relationships that we have. You know, uh, sometimes there is a strong delusion that is all around us in the minds of the people that we meet. Even in the relationships that we have with other people. We encounter a spiritual blindness that we have to resist because it can be strong and if we're not careful, that perspective even from those who are closest to us sometimes, that perspective can drag us into the mindset of the world when really what we want to have is the mind of Christ. And sadly, sometimes that blindness, that spiritual blindness, comes from those who claim to speak the truth of the Word of God. So Paul tells us that there are relationships, relationships that we should embrace, relationships that we should cultivate, relationships that we should value and protect. Then he tells us that there are relationships that are full of danger for us, relationships that we need to be careful of, Even some relationships that we might avoid altogether because they will damage our testimony for Jesus Christ. So we have to learn how to live among the people in this world, the people we encounter every day, to live in such a way that the integrity of Christ is not compromised by us. And by our behavior. Paul tells us we need to be careful. We need to be careful. We need to think about how we are living so that we might truly live in obedience to him. So that we might do what is right in his sight, according to his word. Doing what we have been entrusted to do by him so that we bring glory to his name. And by doing that, Paul tells us, we will impact the world for Jesus. Our lives will display the transforming power of his grace. That is the Christian life. That is a life that brings honor and glory to Jesus. Paul says this in verse 9 of Titus Chapter 3. We need to be careful. We need to be careful about certain things, he says. Shun these things. Periastemi. Turn away from those that are not sincere in their desire to understand the truth of the word of God. Do not listen to them. Do not argue with them. Why? Second Timothy chapter 2, we're told why. Paul says it's useless to debate these things. They serve no purpose. Because these words from these men, he calls an infectious disease. They do nothing except to contaminate those who hear them. Resist their efforts to distort the truth, Paul says there. Resist them how? With the word of God. Take a stand for Christ. Stand on his word. Paul says avoid these foolish morass, these empty-headed, godless, ridiculous controversies. Zetes discussions, endless discussions, speculations, questions that only stir up more contentious debates. Discussions where there are, is really no sincere desire to understand the Word of God. For them, it's an intellectual debate. Avoid these kind of discussions, Paul says. They revolve around human wisdom. They revolve around human reason. The 
that revolve around philosophies that have been formed by men. These are ideas that come from the imaginations of men. It's a fruitless discussion, Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.6. It won't lead to faith. But it will only lead to more speculation. To more arguments. As they attack the truth. They try to tear it down. Based on what? Based on their own opinions. Based on their own ideas. And Paul says you need to avoid these discussions concerning genealogies. Genealo Gina, pedigrees, family history, lineage. The idea that their family history, their ancestors, will somehow validate their relationship with God. Using lists of names, even from the Bible, and coming up with elaborate mythological stories and inaccurate interpretations of scripture, things that may appear to be valid and may make some sense by our standards, but these things have no basis in the Bible. And books, entire books have been written about these genealogies. But they can't find any basis for it in the Bible at all. So these things are still doctrines of demons. Paul says, walk away from these things. They're traps. These are traps that you have to avoid because they will produce nothing in your life of any spiritual value. In fact, they're a diversion. It's a diversion by the enemy designed to take us off track, to take us away from the truth of the word. Avoid them, Paul says. And avoid all kinds of strife, he says in verse 9. Eris, don't waste your time bickering, arguing with someone who only wants to make himself feel good about himself and about his opinions. He wants to win an argument because he is just puffed up in his pride. But what he thinks is great intellect and deep thinking comes from his mind, a mind that is lacking in the truth. So he is only stirring up foolish and ignorant speculations, it says in Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. And there is no foundation in the truth of the word of God. And avoid disputes, Paul says in verse 9. Mache, conflicts, fighting. Don't go back and forth arguing about the word of God. Don't go back and forth arguing about the law, he says, the nomikos, the, the principles that are found in the word of God, God's commandments. These aren't things to be argued about. These people have a preoccupation with the ceremonies, with the rituals, with doing things in the flesh and thinking that they will obtain salvation. They have an incorrect belief, a belief that is held by many by many who claim to know Jesus Christ, that they can earn their salvation. They can buy their way into heaven by what they do or by what they don't do. These are traditions of men, traditions held by many groups who claim to speak the truth, but they have incorrectly 
equated their traditions with the authority of the truth of the word of God. But don't argue with them about it. Don't argue about theology with them. Or doctrine. Or morality. Don't argue with these people who distort the word of God. It's pointless, Paul says. These are wasted words. Why? He says in verse 9, they are unprofitable. Anotheles. These are useless words. Don't waste your time. These false teachers aren't interested in the truth. They're only interested in themselves. So no matter what we present to them from the word of God, Paul said it, it's worthless to them. Mateos, it is It'll serve no purpose. It won't change their mind. It won't change their heart. They are like horses that have blinders on. So they have a very limited vision. But you know, as deceived as they are, isn't it amazing to find so many people following them? So many people believing the teaching that they are bringing. There always seems to be large crowds around them, and the people in those crowds sometimes even carry a Bible. And they're ready to embrace these lies, which are the lies of the enemy. As these men stand there, maligning and disgracing the way of the truth. Paul says, run from them. Leave the building. Turn off the TV. Throw away the book. Shut down the website. But get out. Get out from under that false teaching and do it now. That is a relationship that you do not need to cultivate. That is a relationship that you do not need because that is a relationship that will drag you down into the pit of hell. Then there are those we encounter within the church. They're not necessarily in a leadership position there. But it always seems that they're at odds with the leadership. It always seems that they are, they're being obstinate and, and unrelenting in things that they claim to know, spiritual things, but things that they really don't understand at all. And the problem is, they won't listen to anyone. They won't listen to anyone as they present the truth of the word of God. They won't listen to the leadership. They only listen to themselves. They only listen to their own opinions and their own conclusions when it comes to Scripture. Paul says in verse 10 to do this, he says, reject them. Paratheomai. Refuse to have anything to do with them. Don't fellowship with these factious Men. Hieratikos, with one who causes division. But it's not division based on sound doctrine. They're not taking a stand for the truth. But it's division based on their commitment to themselves. Their commitment to their own opinions. And then, They take those opinions and they begin to spread them around the fellowship, trying to get people to gather around their ideas. They are in opposition to the leadership. They're in opposition to the word of God. So they are in opposition to Jesus Christ. This is disruptive behavior within the body of Christ. And this needs to be addressed by the leaders in the church. Keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, it says in Romans chapter 16. Things that are contrary to the teaching 
that you have learned. Turn away from them, it says. For such men are not slaves of our Lord Jesus Christ, but they are slaves of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of many of God's people. So the leaders in the church need to deal with this situation. They need to meet with this person. They need to pray with this person. They need to sit down and talk about the truth of the word of God and to correct him. And by God's grace, perhaps this man or woman may come to his senses and turn from his sin. But, Paul says, after a first and a second warning, a nuthesia, after repeated instruction and exhortation and explanation and training and teaching from the word, if this person will not come under the authority of the leadership, in the church, if he will not come under the authority of the word of God, then that person may be asked to leave the fellowship. Knowing this, Paul says in verse 11, oida, recognizing it, seeing it right in front of our eyes and demonstrate it before us, we see his true character. We see the character of this man. It's revealed by his words. It's revealed by his actions. Such a man, Paul says, is perverted, extrafel. He's turned inside out. He's twisted up inside. And he is sinning. Hamartano. He is committing an offense, not only against the people of God, but he is committing an offense against God himself by his willful and his continual rebellion, bringing himself to a point, it says, where he is self-condemned, auto katakritos, from his own mouth, by his own words, by his, his life, by his actions, he exposes his own sin. So, there's a relationship that we need to avoid. And there are relationships that we should not be a part of. We need to have the discernment and the understanding to know that. But Paul says there are relationships that we should embrace and that we should cultivate and that we should value. We should take care of our fellow servants in Christ. Titus was to remain on Crete so that he could set in order the things that needed to be set in order there in the fellowships, in the churches there. But you know, he was only there for a short time. Everything in life has a season. Even our relationships have a season. There's a beginning. And an end to everything. So, you know, we need to make the most of the time that the Lord has given us because we don't know how much time he actually has given us. And during that time, we need to develop those relationships, our relationships, relationships that we have that will have eternal value. And for Titus, the time was coming when he would leave Crete, he would leave those men and women that he had been ministering to. His season of ministry would be over there. And that time would come, Paul says, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you to assume your responsibilities that you have there. Now, we don't know anything about this man, Artemis. He's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible except here. But we do know this, 
that Paul must have believed that he could handle the assignment on Crete. So he was like Titus. Must have been a man of integrity. Must have been a man of spiritual maturity. A man of character. A man who was equipped, spiritually sound, so that he could handle the responsibility to faithfully represent Christ. But Tychicus we do know a little bit about. Galatians, uh, Colossians 4, 7. Paul calls him a beloved brother. Calls him a faithful servant, a, a fellow bond slave. And in Acts 20, we're told that uh, he was with Paul on his third missionary journey. So, this man, Tychicus, would have endured the same difficulties and the persecution that, that Paul endured. So either way, whether it was Artemis or Tychicus, these brothers and sisters in Christ on the island of Crete would be receiving a man of God. A man who would be worth getting to know. A man uh, that we might like to develop a relationship with. And when he arrives, Paul says, it will be time for you to leave. And you, he said, must make every effort. Spudazzo. Be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis. Well, in the ancient world, there were at least seven cities that were called Nicopolis. Because every time a general conquered a city, he named it Nicopolis, because the word means city of victory. But the Nicopolis that is probably referred to here is located in Greece, on the southwestern portion of Greece, the city founded by Octavian, Augustus, uh, after he defeated Mark Anthony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium in uh, 31 B.C., and he named that place Nicopolis. It was a city of victory for him. Paul says, I've decided to, to spend the winter there. Did he ever reach Nicopolis? Some people think he did. But we really don't know. Because it was around that time that he was arrested again for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was taken to Rome. And sometime later he was executed by the Emperor Nero. And did Titus ever see Paul again? Some people think he did. But we really don't know that either. Whether he saw him or not, the work of the Lord goes on. Paul makes that point. It continues. And we all have a part in it. We all have a season. We all have a responsibility to Christ. So Paul speaks about two more men who would be passing through the island of Crete. He says, Dil diligently help these men. Spaldaios proempos. Be eager to assist them. These are two workers for the kingdom. First, Zenos, the lawyer. We don't know whether he was a scribe, an expert in Jewish law, or was he an advocate, an expert in civil law, in Roman law. And then there was another man who would be with him. Paul says, assist him. This would be Apollos, the preacher, the man who is mighty in the scriptures, it says in Acts chapter 18. A lawyer and a preacher. There's a team. <laughs> Send them forth, Paul says. Send them on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. Take care of them. Meet their needs. They labor for Christ. They're part of the team. We have a responsibility. Isn't that what Paul's saying? We have a responsibility to each other. We have a responsibility to take care of each other as those who faithfully serve the Lord. Paul says, this isn't something that you're supposed to do, 
Titus, not just you, but he says, let the people get involved. The people, our people, who are there in the fellowships on the island of Crete, let them also learn. Manthano, let them act as disciples of Christ and receive this instruction that they are to be eager to engage in good works. Proistemi, they're to take the initiative. They're to take the lead. Nobody needs to be pushing them along. They need to get involved. They need to help. They need to do what's right. They need to do what's good and excellent. They need to help meet pressing needs, he says. Anankaios. Difficulties, problems, distressing situations that come up. Everybody in the fellowship is to be involved in the work of the Lord. Especially when things are difficult. And things were difficult. Things continue to be difficult. But Paul says we need to help each other. We need to pour our lives into each other. That we, he says in verse 14, not just them, that we may not be unfruitful, akarpos, without increase. That in our lives, we might see and experience growth, spiritual growth. These are the last words that Paul spoke to these brothers and sisters on Crete. Don't give up. Keep at it. Keep on pressing on for Christ. And then a final word to Titus. Titus, Paul says, all who are with me, wherever Paul was at that point, perhaps in Macedonia somewhere, He says, all that are here with me, they greet you. They know you by name. They know who you are. They care about you. What an encouragement for Titus. There are people who care. There are people who care about me. What an encouragement. We need to encourage each other and tell each other that we really care. And Paul says, Greet those there on Crete. Greet those who love us. Those who care about us in the faith, in the Lord. Titus, my dear son in the faith, may the grace of God, his favor, his blessing be with you. And with all who read this letter, who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, like Titus, are encouraged by your word. We are encouraged, Lord, because we know that we are heading to that city of victory. We will be there. We will be together. May we, Lord God, do what we are to do along the way to bring glory to you, to be faithful to you, to be faithful to your word, that we might be a testimony of the grace that you have shown to us. Lives that have been transformed by your love, by your grace, by our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.